Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, April 4th, 2019 regular meeting of the school committee. Uh, we have just come from our executive session where we met for the purpose of discussing strategy with respect to litigation because doing so in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the school committee. At this point, we're going to rise uh, to say the Pledge of Allegiance for those who would like to join us in the audience. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So thank you all for being here. This is great to see so many people here. Uh, we have a number of uh, recognitions. So uh, do we want to start? With, let's start with the recognitions out of order since we have that, and then we can come back for public comment after that. Certainly. So I know that we have the high school and middle school robotics teams and the high school business professionals of America. And so I am going to invite Mr. Scott up with uh, his folks, and I will let you take it from here. Welcome. So, a lot. What do you want to turn us? Where would you like us? You guys can stand in front of us. You don't need to. You don't need to see us. Yeah, you can you go. stand right. Come right back here. Come right in front. Do you yeah. like film for TV? Okay, sure. Fill in the space. There we go. This is great. All right, right come on in. Yeah, we move out of the way. Yeah, come on in. BPA, everybody. <laughs> come on in. We'll gang up. Sure, yeah, that's it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Come on in, guys. All right. That was a great idea. Okay. You want me to talk into the Okay, that's good. All right, so I'm going to introduce, uh, is Pat up here as well? Come on up, Pat. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the group, <laughs> and thankfully uh, a lot of them were able to make it tonight. Uh, we have, uh, we'll start with our younger group. Uh, we have our middle school robotics team, Team 1715C, uh, led by uh, Pat Allen, uh, who's our middle school coach. And what we'll do is, if we can, hopefully with the microphone, we'll have all the kids introduce themselves and... I'll just, you can say what grade you're in. Is that good? So these, this crew here, uh, they recently went to, I'll let Pat explain the, the event they went to. So the students attended the Southern New England Regional Championship at Quinsig on March, weekend yeah, the March. second weekend in March, thank you. And uh, this incredible group of students uh, really blew away a lot of the judges, the competitors, the coaches, the other coaches uh, approached me. They won three awards. They sort of dominated with uh, the STEM Research Project Award, which is incredible. Uh, their Robot Skills Champions and their Teamwork Challenge Champions. So those three top um, awards went to 1715C. They called themselves the Cool Cats, which they got the name because of Mr. Scott, believe it or not, who called them some cool cats, and they decided to stick with it. They were a great group, yeah. And it was impressive, and, and I, I don't uh, just throw things around, and I, I recently just was standing back here, and I said to them, I, I feel like they're the most prepared team that I've seen uh, come out of the program. So our fourth year at the middle school and this is definitely our most prepared group and they work really really hard at it and as a nice side note uh, they just recently held like a board meeting with uh, does anybody like blenders sure. the, uh, the the ninja company that makes blenders you've seen those the, the, shark right? the, the shark ninja company they hosted the shark ninja company at the middle school and were able to raise uh, a donation of five thousand dollars from Shark Ninja to help fund their, their trip. Yeah. So everybody in Hopkin and buy a Ninja blender. <laughs> yeah, right. No. Uh, so that's our middle school crew. Then we have. Uh, we'll we'll keep on the robotics theme right now. Uh, we have two teams from the high school this year that qualified for the world's tournament. So we're gonna be there just prior to the middle school students. And we'll leave and then they'll come in. Uh, the middle school uh, students will leave. The high school, oh, I'm sorry, the 
high school students will be there the, uh, the time before that. And uh, we have team 2602H. Uh, they qualified with a very high skills score. They had the, I believe, the fourth highest skills ranking in Massachusetts, uh, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we have uh, team 2602A, which is our uh, Italian-American <laughs> crew. We have uh, Ricardo's, our, one of our guests from Italy this year, and uh, that team, uh, they won the Build Award uh, for a very unique design that they have, uh, and both teams have done very well throughout the season, so they're prepared to go. Um, we have, I'll have the students uh, just introduce themselves. You just, your name and grade? So and you guys didn't do that earlier. <laughs> okay, we'll come, we'll come right around. We'll go right to the middle school too. Go ahead. I'm Ricardo and I'm a senior. I'm Jay, I'm a sophomore. I'm Tejas, I'm a sophomore too. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the crew, I'm a sophomore. Uh, I'm Kutant, I'm a freshman. I'm Sam Kalt, I'm a sophomore. I'm Ritesh, I'm a junior. I'm Shashir, I'm a sophomore. I'm Shashir, I'm a senior. I'm Levanch, I'm a sophomore. Uh, I'm Jake, I'm a sixth grader. Um, I'm Serena, and I'm in sixth grade. Um, I'm Shujan, and I'm in sixth grade. I'm Sam, and I'm in sixth grade. I'm Preston, and I'm also in sixth grade. I'm Dylan, and I'm in sixth grade. I'm Riley, and I'm in eighth grade. I'm Dishan, and I'm in seventh grade. <laughs> All right, very good. And the last group that I'll introduce tonight uh, is the Business Professionals of America group that we have here at the high school. We have 11 students traveling to California. Uh, with myself and Mr. Bishop in the back. Uh, we're traveling out to California as a group. Uh, these students are, are 11 of 20 that went to a state conference. Uh, these are the 11 that qualified and have placed very well in their uh, competition. So they're practicing. They just submitted their final drafts uh, to the national judges. They'll go out and they will uh, re you know, present their work and uh, if they make the cut, they'll go into a final round while they're there, and then they will uh, hopefully do well. They've been working really hard. We also had the unique uh, honor this year of having one of our members run for state officer, uh, Tiffany Ramsaran. You can wave your hand there. It's Tiffany right in the middle. Um, she, she had to go through uh, a campaign while at the state conference. And then she sat down and was interviewed by uh, the board of directors, uh, the adults that run the uh, program. And uh, so with voting and those interviews, Tiffany was elected the president of Massachusetts BPA. So very good. Uh, so we have, if I could, if I could just have the BPA students introduce themselves and what competition you'll be competing in while at nationals. Very good. So that's our crew. All right. Thank you very much to uh, the school committee and administration for supporting us this year. I know, um, you know, it's a big deal to allow the kids to go out and do all these things. Uh, but I always say that, you know, there's a lot of learning that goes on outside of these four walls. And these students have picked up a lot of education. Uh, through the processes that they've gone through. So thank you for supporting that. Appreciate it.
crowd is going to be short lived. I'm so excited to have so many, but I'm realizing. I'm sure it's on Snapchat. So we should get a picture with all of them. We should have. Let's get back. Let's not make a spurt. You can stay. Yeah. 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 Whatever you're more limited. Yeah. Like a very impressive oh, I, I, I used to like that last year, I know. <laughs> we don't have student council reps here, do we? I don't believe we do. With, with your permission, Nancy, if I may. Uh, great job, everyone. And thank you so much, Mr. Scott. Yes. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out here. Uh, we are always so impressed with all of the work that you are doing. You make the entire district proud. So thank you. Oh, oh they're, show, oh, they're showing their Why are you doing that over here? Yes, we have one. I didn't know. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I was like, oh. Oh, yes, put it in front of the camera. Oh, good. Oh, that's great. Excellent. We're all wondering what that was. I wanted to know about their knee patches. I saw those too. A Vex robotics thing, and they came up with the idea of yeah. cutting that out and ironing them with like a thing onto their jeans. That's awesome. Like it's not an actual iron on. They did it. So the robot can hold six pounds at one time, but there's a limit to how much pounds it can actually hold in the air. So it only holds one. And it drags the rest of the five onto the ground because you have to get it over a bump. So it drags these over the bump. And then there's a building zone where you have to push the hubs in. So it pushes all of them in and stacks them. And then there's also a hanging structure where you have to hang from. So we made this that hangs off of the hanging structure. And Maybe Dylan can drive it backwards through the, in the carpet. Yeah. It goes faster on a um, field. <laughs> Is yeah, you have one minute. One minute. Yeah, there's a whole So, and then if there's anybody here who wanted to come up to speak for public comment, feel free to come up uh, and speak now. <laughs> Just in case. Nancy, are we going to recognize the jazz ensemble? So they are not here. Oh, are they coming next time? Do you know? I, um, are they, do you think, going to come to a different meeting? No, I think Georgette had been emailing, but we haven't gotten a response from them, so. So would you like to speak a little bit to their, because you were there, were you? I would love to speak on That'd behalf be, of the Jazz Ensemble. Sure. Oh, that would be lovely. Thank you. Um, so we had on our agenda to recognize the Jazz Ensemble from the Hoppington High School. And um, my son is in the Jazz Ensemble, so I have personal experience with it. But I just, it's a group of phenomenal musicians. They um, meet before school at 6.30 most days of the week and uh, Wednesday evenings. And it is completely... Um, a group that's born out of the love of jazz from Mr. Dodge, who has really created this group and brought them to where they are today. He, I think three years ago, started taking them to the um, MAJE conference uh, competition, which is just like MICA, which is coming up this weekend, only for jazz. And the first year, I think they participated. Last year, they advanced, but then did not get recognition at the state level. And this year, they advanced and received gold recognition at the state level. It was a huge accomplishment. They were thrilled. And um, it's just, I, I can't say enough for the jazz program. And music itself is a, is a great um, 
discipline to study, but jazz in particular requires a lot of um, communication skills, listening, um, appreciating everyone as they're taking solos and improvising and experimenting. Um, and it's a, a type of musical performance that really um, encourages, the, encourages kids to um, take risks and to really um, challenge themselves and fail and then try again. And it's, it's just, a, it teaches them so many things. And Mr. Dodge has done a great job. So I think they were thrilled that they received gold. And I think there are great things on the horizon. That's great. That's great. Thank you for providing that. Uh, it, it's been fun. I've been watching from the background because I have not actually seen them up close like that. Yeah, they're a quiet group for being. A, they're, they're in before school and they kind of yeah. they go off and do their own thing, but they um, they put a lot of time in. So that's great. You're a good spokesperson. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, sure Mr. Thing. Bishop, would you like to come out of order, or do you um, to come now, say, or do you want to stay for a whole meeting anyway? <laughs> 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 We're excited to have you. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. I'm just getting set up here. All right. All right. Well, I appreciate you having me here uh, and allowing me the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the conversations that we've been having at the high school this year in regards to our master schedule. Um, so uh, we have been talking about it for the most for most of this year, to be honest with you. And, um, and even before that, uh, this is my 14th year here at the high school, and I've been part of at least seven scheduling committees in my, my time, <laughs> whether it was a school council or assistant principal or principal. So it's certainly a uh, topic that we've been talking about. We haven't changed our schedule once since I've been here in 2005. Um, so we have been debating, does our current schedule still meet the needs of all of our students and staff? So that's kind of the essential question, so to speak, is we've kind of done our work this year. Um, but I thought I'd kind of talk a little bit about how we got here. Uh, we've given some surveys, we have some statistics, and we have some proposals that we're hoping to kind of put in place, some for next year, and then uh, maybe a bigger kind of scheduling change potential for the following school year. So, um, so I think in terms of uh, the goals at the high school, I think we all know that we've been focusing quite a bit on social emotional learning. Uh, it's been a goal of ours now for a number of years, um, doing quite a bit of work around this. Um, we just got our Metro West Adolescent Health Survey back, and our numbers are, are down in regards to some of the uh, mental health and stress levels, but still, they're, they're, they're still high, and there's still, there's still work to be done there. Um, but either way, the, those, those numbers are still higher than we'd like to see. So continues to be a focus of ours. So um, that started our year when it comes to our school improvement plan. Then we had our NEASC visit, if you could remember, back in October, where a group of individuals came in and kind of did an assessment on how uh, Hopkinton High School is meeting the standards. And that uh, was a great visit, but they gave us six recommendations. And one of the recommendations that stood out above the rest of them was how stressed the students and staff seemed to be. Uh, and they were pretty concerned about that. Uh, and they said, you have to start to think about some of the things that you're doing. And we've done homework-free weekends. We have done homework-free vacations. We have done mindfulness uh, focus in certain classes. Uh, we've done movement breaks in certain classes. We've done a lot of different things, but they're kind of just been around the edges. And they said you need to kind of think about some of the structures that you have in place and maybe make some bigger changes when it comes to this SEL focus. So one of those areas was the master schedule because it continues to be discussed. And then we had an ed camp, which is a professional development opportunity back in the beginning of November for our staff. And we break up into different groups and middle school came over. And one of the big topics that continued to be discussed was our schedule and uh, semesterization and how kids switch teachers mid-year and uh, how a lot of the teachers wanted to keep their kids, especially when they have a full year class. We talk about building relationships and the value of that. So we had a lot of great discussions just around what are we doing with our schedule? Is this something that we can look at as part of this SEL work that we can make some changes to see if uh, students can feel more supported and staff? So then we created a, a survey uh, at the end of November, right around Thanksgiving time, where we sent out basically one question to all the students. And we said, if you wanted to see our schedule change, what would be something you'd like to see? And we gave them a bunch of different options. And uh, 1,109 students filled out the survey. Uh, we have just shy of 1,200 students at the high school. Most surveys get about 400 students that respond. So there was a large amount of students that were interested in this topic. Same question to the staff. We had about 106 staff fill out the survey, which again is a pretty high percentage. So a lot of interest in terms of what they would like to see. Uh, and I'm going to get into those results in a second. In addition to 
the NEASC feedback, the EdCamp discussion, the feedback from the survey, we also put together, once again, another scheduling committee um, with one member of every department at the high school. And part of their work in December and a little bit into January was to shadow a student for the day. So um, we had students that were taking all different types of classes, all different grades, and our staff would follow them around for the day. And so we got some of their feedback about how that day felt, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. We've also been having these conversations in school council, which is made up of parents, students, and teachers, uh, as well as my principal's cabinet, which meets once a month. It's a group of 12 students. So uh, the focus this year has been a lot on kind of making some tweaks when it comes to our, our schedule. So that's a little bit about how we got here. So in regards to the survey, there were five common responses. And, and the first one is on the top because it was the most, um, I guess, popular uh, response was the addition of a flex block period. And I'll talk a little bit about what a flex block might look like. But that was 61% uh, of the students picked that as their top option. The next highest percentage, I believe, was 22%, which was uh, a later start time. So a pretty significant gap between what the students were looking for. Um, it was also the highest percentage of the staff. Um, I believe it was around 44% of staff, and the next highest percentage was around 19%. So again, pretty, pretty big gap in terms of, of what that response was. Other things that came out through comments and through discussions, um, one was around revisiting our advisory. And we've had an advisory program since 2003. Um, it was the model program, I feel, for a number of years. Um, but just with the changes of uh, the many different things that go on at the high school, the, the program has lost a little bit of its momentum. Uh, and we, are, we feel that this is a time that we can kind of take a step back from advisory, maybe rebrand it a little bit and, and, and have a different focus. Uh, we th feel like with the addition of Hiller Days and not having advisory so consistently, the feedback we got from most students and a lot of staff is that this might be something we want to take a look at. So I think we've been holding on to it a little bit longer than we probably need to. Uh, so we want to re look at revisiting that. Uh, connecting semester one and semester two, what I mean by that is right now we have two entirely different schedules from September to January, and then we have a brand new schedule from January to June. Teachers change, classes change, rooms change, the makeup of the classes change. So it's a lot of work for guidance to create two entirely different schedules every year. Um, most high schools don't have that model. So we were hoping to try to connect our year-long classes. So if a student had... Um, uh, you know, Miss Miss Ellum, let's just say, our, our subject matter leader in English for fr uh, first semester, period one. They'd also have Miss Ellum, period one, second semester, with the same group of students. And that is about that idea of kind of continuing to build relationships, which we continue to have a focus on. Um, and it helps with letters of recommendation, getting to know the kids. So it, it's an important uh, move that we'd like to try to make. The other one that came out is uh, adding more Hiller days. Now, I talked about uh, later start time was definitely a question that we asked in our survey. Um, and I'm always... Um, surprised at the level of or the lack of interest I should say from the students when we talk about a later start time uh, I think I may have mentioned this either here or another uh, a meeting where we have in our school council I had people kind of stand up we do an agree or disagree activity and I said would you like to you know would you agree with the idea of doing a later start time and all the adults went to the agree and the 12 students went to the disagree and we had a very interesting discussion so what was coming out in the feedback is they liked the Hiller days they liked that kind of once a month later uh, once a week or once every other week I should say later start time but they don't want it all the time so that was interesting um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what our hope is with Hiller days and the last um, response that came out was adding a fourth lunch. Right now we have three lunches um, and we have about 365 seats in our cafeteria and we have about 1,200 students. So you can just try to do the math there. Uh, now not every senior stays and eat lunch at, at the high school, so uh, that's not always going to be 1,200 kids eating lunch every day. Uh, but we are at capacity when it comes to our lunch periods, so we need to kind of build some, some time in for an additional lunch. So we've been working on how that schedule would look like. I'm actually meeting with some of our uh, food service people uh, after vacation about trying to develop that. So those, again, were the most common responses. So um, what we then talked about as a kind of a staff and in these different groups is that's, that's, that's a lot of different things to think about. So kind of what's in our control? What can we kind of make a change on that might not have, might be easier to do than other changes? What needs more exploration? You know, like that flex block idea. I think a lot of people have questions about that. So we might need to look into that a little bit more. What needs additional funding? Um, schools that have the flex block, which a number of high schools around the area have a kind of a sophisticated pass system electronically where a student will have an electronic pass to go see a different teacher. That obviously costs money. So what needs additional funds before we try to roll anything out? And I always keep in mind how much change is too much change at once, right? 
So those are things that are kind of guiding our, our work when we, when we look at kind of things that we want to change. And so ultimately with the scheduling committee and the staff, we've decided to try to have a two-phase um, process when it comes to making some scheduling changes. We felt for next year, we would like to try to do our best with Linda Henderson's help and support to try to connect semester one and two year-long teachers. Uh, we would like to try to have every Friday be a Hiller day. Um, we would like to take a year off from advisory. Uh, so that time on learning actually would kind of be a wash if you get rid of advisory and add a Hiller day every week. Um, we also were thinking about having one of our Hiller days a month, maybe the first Friday of every month, be an extra help Hiller day. So right now, Hiller days are for teachers to have extra time to plan with one another because that's really important, that PLC time, which we don't have in our schedule, and it allows students to come in school a little bit late, get that extra sleep. Maybe one of those opportunities could be an extra help session, which would kind of act a little bit like a flex block, potentially, for the following year. Give us a little bit of a test run of what that would look like. So um, that's what some of the things we've been talking about, but um, we were hoping to do that, and then creating that fourth lunch period. So those are some things we we're hoping to do for next year, and we feel like we can make those changes. The following year, uh, 20, 2021, which is crazy to say, um, we'd be thinking about potentially implementing a flex block. What that looks like yet, we don't know. If we're going to go in that direction yet, we're not quite sure, but we're going to take next school year to really dive in and think about this process and what it's going to look like, how it can benefit the school. Maybe we'll go on some visits to other high schools that have this. Um, and that's what the focus of the scheduling committee and some of school council will be throughout the course of the year. Um, but I think people were very excited when we started talking about a flex block and when I told them it was going to be a two-phase process there was some disappointment I think from the staff uh, they were really hoping that we would push this for next year but you need to be thoughtful you need to be reasonable you need to make sure that if you're going to implement a change like this it's going to be well thought out uh, so that's why we kind of have this in, in a two-phase process so uh, I know that we are not 100% going in this direction we have some work to do but uh, the next slide we have up here kind of defines what really a flex block is and um, it's a period during the day, and different schools have different times when their flex block is. Um, but it gives opportunity for students to uh, get extra help, get remediation, uh, enrichment, and, and many other opportunities. College fairs, counseling visits. Um, you know, some schools have speaker series where people come in and speak to the kids from different professions. So there's a lot of potential. Uh, but you have to be very clear about what needs to be part of the flex block to have it be successful. So again, that's going to be some of the work, but I thought I would, uh, I would definitely throw up the definition so you could see what that is. Um, next slide is some of the statements that came out from our survey of why we would even consider a flex block. And as you can see up there, students are again reporting that there's little downtime built into the day. Uh, they're feeling overwhelmed, they're feeling overbooked, um, and I think the parents feel the same, same way calling their students so stressed a number of times in a survey that we recently gave out. And NEASC also noticed that when they came in. Um, and teachers are feeling a little bit frustrated, frustrated with students being pulled from class for many reasons. I know you talked about the jazz band earlier, and uh, we have Micah coming up. Oftentimes, we have to kind of pull students from class to be able to get extra practice. Um, so those could be some things, potentially, that could, could, could serve in a flex block. Um, and teachers also reporting they just don't have enough time in the day. And that was a big feedback from the teachers. They didn't realize how uh, how fast the pace was for a student in a given school day now. I mean, they remember it a little bit when they were students, but they were all, uh, 10 of them, were just amazed how quickly you go from one class to the next. You have a 20-minute lunch period, right back to the next class, five minutes, next class, and it just seems like they are just on this treadmill, and they're going a million miles an hour, and there's no time for reflection. There's no time to kind of slow down a little bit. Um, and so those are some of the things why, why schools go in the direction of a flex block. So um, the pros of a flex block on the, on the next slide. Um, you know, you can see up there, obviously, there could be a potential reduction of stress of this time in the day for students to get extra help who might not be able to stay after school for a variety of reasons, whether they have family commitments or they have athletics or they have other uh, things going on after school. Uh, gives an opportunity for some, some enrichment for students and also some from re uh, remediation for students that need extra help. Um, gives additional time for students and teachers to kind of build relationships It also uh, lets guidance counselors have a little bit more time to meet with the students. Uh, maybe less kids will be pulled out of class. And also maybe teachers could prep a little bit more during that time as well. So a lot of pros uh, when it comes to this idea of a flex block. The cons, I think, um, and, I, and I put up here, you know, a lot of people just don't like change. And, and we've been, like I said, had this schedule for a long period of time. So I think some, 
that there's that. Uh, I think the idea of maybe some the feeling of loss of instructional time is certainly something that's valid and that we'd have to consider and talk about. I think there'll be, with the flex block and the remediation and the extra help, there'll be other opportunities for instructional time that might, that, that might not seem like traditional instructional time. But either way, th th there'll be uh, some changes when it comes to that number. Um, students may be roaming around the building, what it would look like logistically. Those are things that we kind of have to figure out as we roll this out potentially. Um, and what do you do with students who are caught up? You know, what are those opportunities for them? All things that right now I don't have the answers for. And that's part of the reason why we didn't roll this out right away. We want to make sure we're thoughtful and uh, have conversations before we, we make any decisions when it comes to the flex block. So, um, and again, like I talked about, the next steps really are to continue meeting as a scheduling committee, um, faculty meetings, uh, school council, and I've already set up some, some visits for some of our students on the principal's cabin as well as our um, uh, scheduling committee to go visit some local high schools that have a flex block. Um, so that's really the next steps, but I, I wanted to come here tonight to talk specifically about the changes for next year. Uh, I think maybe we'll be back here next year talking about the idea of a flex block and where we're at as a committee. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of the conversations that we're having. Um, but for next year, I think the biggest change that I was hoping to have a discussion about is going from every other Friday, Hiller Day, to having every Friday be a Hiller Day. And I know that has an impact on the community. I know it has an impact on other buildings. And so that's why we, um, I wanted to come here and, and, and be transparent and open and have a conversation about the benefits, certainly at the high school that I feel will um, have a lot of impact on the kids and the staff. But I um, wanted to get your feedback on, on the thoughts of, of that decision. So again, thank you for having me. And I love how much thought went into this. You were able to take us along on your journey there with how much happened before you even got here. Uh, I'm curious about the survey that you did and it's the students looking at the later start time was that did you say 22 percent uh yes 22 percent um on that survey pick that as their top option yeah okay so that it doesn't mean that 80 percent roughly are opposed to it correct i just yep. was just was curious as a general yep. and i think what i've heard from students is they they're not against the idea of a later start time they're just not so much for the later end time <laughs> like right. a shorter and day. everything else that goes along with that. And so that's why I think a Hiller day kind of is able to um, kind of fit both worlds in a lot of ways. You get the later start time, but you're still ending at that same time. And we still meet our 990 time on learning, which is obviously very important. So I figured you did. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. But curious, because now Hiller uh, days have been around for a little bit. Do you see more kids in the high school me doing meetings and other stuff that they aren't able to do on other days, on Hiller days now, than you did when it first started? Yeah, it, it, it's a nice environment here on a Hiller Day. I'd say about 50% of the students are here in the building, yeah. and another 50 are coming in right around the bell. So that some of them are getting that extra uh, extra sleep. And um, if you were to walk down the hallways, there's, there's always a group of students that are playing guitar in the hallway and, 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 and singing. And um, the basketball gym is always being used. Kids are shooting hoops, and some kids are working out in the gym. Um, and then it's just the collaboration in the library and just throughout the course, it, it, throughout the building is really nice to see. Um, so I think they really enjoy that opportunity to kind of start the day. I've had anecdotally kids say that they do better on tests and quizzes on those days. That's just them telling me. I don't know. I don't have any data for that. Um, but they just feel a little bit fresher and um, more rested for the day. So. It seems like it's a it, way to ease into the day rather than kind of go right at 725 into yeah. whatever it is. Absolutely. That you and I think the staff really appreciates the opportunity to be able to work with one another. And, and look at assessments and talk about the upcoming units and you know lessons and ask questions and that's been that's been very uh, impactful for them as well that's great thank you yes so I, I feel the same way that the process um, thank you for sharing that that seemed so thoughtful and the fact that you had so many response yeah it was great. such great response yeah. what made you think of uh, having kids be shadowed is that something you had heard somewhere uh, uh, I think that's a very good idea to kind of observe them firsthand. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, Mr. Han and Mr. Palmville and I did this about two years ago, where we observed some students, um, and it was really eye-opening for us. Um, yeah. We, you know, if you read some articles and in, in, in different things on on social media, there's a, a lot of administrators that get out and do these types of shadows and try to get into as many classrooms as possible. And uh, we wanted our staff to have the opportunity. But they're so dedicated, they, they just didn't want to miss any class time. But they could see the value of it. So uh, we built into um, the day some, some coverage for the staff um, and, and you know, let them plan well in advance you know, to, to, to be able to do the shadows. Um, <clears throat> and it was all people that were, were interested in examining the schedule a little bit more. 
so we kind of put that out to the staff that who wants to be part of this, who wants to do some shadows. Uh, and this group of individual teachers were, was interested. But since they've done this, we've had at least a dozen ask to also be able to do a shadow, which has been great. So um, it, it was something we've seen we've seen in other schools. And again, we we did it a few years ago. So That's so great. from what I heard from the students, they they thought it was really great yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that the teachers did. and not only did they shadow and go to every class. But if it was an exam day, took they tests, took the test. Yeah, they did, and literally, they were all in, and they took it seriously. And the kids, I think, felt very validated and respected by the shadow process. From what I heard, my son wasn't shadowed, but there was a shadow in his most of his classes, and um, it was, I think, very well done and well received. And I think they felt sort of legitimized. Like this is my day. And I'm glad that you're taking a peek at it, like under right. boss, you yeah. know. And they sat, and the, the teachers sat at the lunch table with the student. Right. Yeah. yeah it was great. So there are no assumptions. Right, you, you know, because it's the same thing. You kind of think how you explain that all the parents went to one side mm -hmm. saying you want later start it, mm -hmm. and all the kids went to one side. So yep. there was no opportunity for assumption. You actually went through yeah. um, the whole day. Yep. Um, is it fair to say that your top reason for doing this is to reduce stress in, in kids? <clears throat> I think it's a big part of it. Yeah, that's what I heard from your presentation, and I see you making all those measures every time, um, you know, and all the programming and the focus on SEL. What is it that is being done for uh, parents also to be part of this conversation for stress reduction for kids? Yeah, I, I yeah. feel they yeah, are a big part, a big part. Of, of this. So while you may make all these measures mm -hmm. in school and the teachers feel it and the kids feel it. But what about parents who are such a big part of it? Sure, yeah, and it, that, that's a great point. Um, I, I think that there's probably still a lot of work to be done there. Um, you know, we have quite a few parent nights throughout the course of the year here at the high school, whether it be through our counseling department or even an eighth grade parent night uh, last week where my message was to try to find this balance uh, and to not feel this pressure that you have to put your child in a certain class because that's what you're supposed to do. You know, do what's best for them know their limitations, know their potential, know what their passions are. They can move levels when they get to the high school, but truly believe in that, in that you know, college is just the beginning of something. It's not the end result of something, and that there are many different paths to success and happiness. So I think it's the messaging that we have, and I'd love to have more conversations with the community about this, um, because we see the 1,200 kids every day, and we see what, what the stress that they're under. And it's just, it's, it's a different environment now than it used to be. Uh, even in my 14 years here, I've seen the pressure and the focus on grade point average and <coughs> where students are going to go get greater and greater. Um, and so I think as adults, we need to be very thoughtful about trying to help support the students and not um, push them. Now, granted, the students are part of this. They, there's, a, there's a lot of competition there, but it's, we need to kind of educate everybody in this process. And so. Um, I think we could do more w with parents. I think we try to, whether it be through newsletter communications, parent nights, but there probably should, there could be more opportunities for that. Right. I, I would love to see that. And I, I think as parents, a lot of us would realize that. But what ends up <coughs> happening is that there is a group mentality. Of course. Right? Mm -hmm. So once you're in the group, you feel that pressure as parents. So I think having more conversations in the community, that's extremely important and open, honest conversations. And I wish there is, just as you're measuring student stress levels, I wish there was some measurement on the parent expectation uh, levels and how that requires some shift. It's a good. That's a good point. I, I you know, my daughters are six, so I, uh, I said at eighth grade parent, I, I, you know, I'm not really someone to give advice about getting ready to apply to college, but I even see <laughs> it with the, the, the soccer leagues that are already starting and some students being in these leagues versus those leagues, and it's like as a parent, you're like, should we be doing that? So you, are, I already feel that. Exactly. So I understand exactly. that feeling, but um, you know, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is we oftentimes bring parents back to some of our. Uh, parents who have had students that have graduated and gone off to, to college or university come back to talk to parents about the experience okay. and what they wish they had known or could kind of, you know, reduce some of the stress that goes along with that. And so that's um, been really helpful, I think, yeah. for parents, particularly around college stuff. That I think it's the is it the junior night where you the have yep. the parents yeah. come back and have night. gone through the process and make suggestions like don't talk about it every night. Things exactly like that. things like that. And, and I mentioned when we were talking about the flex block about potentially a speaker series, I think having <clears throat> students that are in college come back to talk to students uh, when they're home from break just about the process, uh, I think would also be a nice way to kind of get a message to students. I know it's not talking about the parents necessarily, but um, you know, we've, I sent a survey out to 
um, the students that have graduated from, uh, I believe it was 2011 to 2018, I sent the survey to the class presidents and they kind of tried to get it out to their classes. We didn't hit everybody, of course, but uh, the two biggest things that came back were um, more mental health awareness education within the curriculum that they'd like to see, and the other was having students come back and talk about different career paths. You know, everybody's just so focused on getting into college, but not necessarily what they want to do when they get out of college. And so I think those are some things that we could do a little bit of a better job of when it comes to, and I, was, and I think about that in context with all of this, but that could be an opportunity that we use that flex block for those opportunities. Right now we'd be pulling kids out of class, which is not something we want to be doing. And we can try to do it after school, but they have so many different activities. So. Um, the last one I have is on usage of technology. Mm -hmm. This is something we heard during office hours also uh, uh, when we had the Hopkinton 101 from parents. But that's something, you know, even as a parent of a young child, I feel that you need to have the skills um, to utilize technology. You know, this is the world we are living in right now. But at the same time, how do we learn to put away our devices? And, you know, as adults, also, I can speak for myself, that's something I try to practice, but it's not easy. So when you give this flex schedule, mm -hmm. and you know, kids have more of that time, is there some plan that you have that there would be some reduction of usage of technology and perhaps you know, uh, find other means of communicating, utilizing that time? Some thoughts? And yeah, I think that'll be some stuff that we'll probably talk about as we kind of um, sit down and look at what the flex block would be. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's such a bad thing to have some downtime during the day as well. Maybe, you know, close your lids and, and just have a conversation with a group of students and friends around a, a table. And so um, that also can be a component of the flex block. But I agree with you in terms of uh, technology use. I think, I mean, look at all of us now with our, our laptops out and our phones out. Everybody feels the same way, right? But we need to educate the students of appropriate use. And if you were to walk into many of our classrooms now, there's bins when you walk in where students will put their phones in a bin before they get, they get ready to go to class. Uh, or they'll have things that are hanging over a door where students will put their phone in little sleeves. So just to remind them that <clears throat> let's focus on what we have at hand. And even times when I come into the library and see students sitting around, I, um, <clears throat> I see more and more students kind of putting their computers away, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to have conversations with one another, which is nice to see. So Great. Thank you for thinking through all of this. I don't need to say the same thing you've all said already, but I mean, really, I, I think that there's two many fantastic things about this, but the two that I think really stand out are the fact that this is really for the students, mm -hmm. which is huge. And then the other thing is that, I mean, like you said, it's been a 14-year conversation. It's fantastic that there's actually less talking, more doing happening now here at this moment too, which is awesome. So I think you guys have thought it out and it makes perfect sense what you've presented to me. All right, so if there is nothing else, can I come? Uh, do you want to say, no, I, I couldn't tell if you wanted to say anything. No, no. So, um, I love, the thing, one of the things I love about the high school is that we don't just talk about like the growth mindset, like we're always looking to improve. I mean, even with all the accolades you, you get and they're so well deserved, we're always kind of thinking about where we need to be going and responding to the needs. So I think the idea of looking at the schedule is excellent. Um, I think what, what kind of guides my feeling in response to this, to this is um, I'm protective of learning time. So I, I feel, and I'm sure I know you are as well, so I know anecdotally what I hear um, about the effectiveness of studies that exist today is pretty low. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard for kids to focus, it's hard for them to use that time effectively, it's hard to get your work done and study. Either because you're not focused enough, maybe you need the downtime. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure what what the situation is, but sure. the currently available free time is hard to maximize the use of. Um, so adding more free time <coughs> kind of gives me hesitation. Sure. Um, I think Hiller Day is a great morale booster. I, I love it. I love that it's. You know, I kind of love that it's kind of special. Um, I wonder if it ha will have the same impact if it's every Friday. I don't know, because right now I think kids get psyched, they look forward to it, they anticipate it. So I don't know, I, it, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I don't know how it um, plays off with advisory. I, I think it's great that we're relooking to sort of, relooking at advisory and kind of rethinking that, because it was such a great thing and it seems to have kind of gotten a little stale. So I think it's, it's great that we're looking at that. Will it be one for one? Like if we do, does advisory meet every five days? So advisory meets every other Thursday, and in those opposite weeks is when the Hiller Day happens. Okay. So you'll have so two advisories per month and two Hiller Days per month. Okay. Yeah. 
So. And it's pretty much the same amount of time for the most part. Uh, advisory is a little bit shorter, but um, it's for the most part pretty similar. So I know, like when the survey came out, you know, I heard about it through my high schooler. Um, you know, I think it, the kids look at, would you like a free a free block with no cost to you? Would you like more free time in the morning with no cost to you again? Because we're not staggering, we're not getting out later. Mm -hmm. So it's too sort of like free, free every day, or free just some, every other Friday. Like it's all looking kind of good mm -hmm. from the eyes of a student. So I'm not surprised how the results came out. Mm -hmm. And you know, kind of liken it to, you know, in the workplace, if someone said you want an extra coffee break, you'd be like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if you're up against a hard deadline, you can't take advantage. It's hard to take advantage of the coffee break you have. So I worry about like the AP classes, mm -hmm. where the AP classes have to deliver a set curriculum, and every time we have like a snow day or you know any time off, the teachers get stressed, sure. the students get stressed, the homework goes up because you have to cover that material by the exam, regardless of you know that's. It has to be covered. So I get worried when we start to shave time off of class because I know how, at least for the for the 1,100 seats a year roughly that we have of students in AP classes, that those kids need to hit that curriculum by April. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just would li I'd like to hear back from the AP teachers that they're you know comfortable with yeah, yeah. the changes. So. Yeah. But, and you're focusing a little bit. You're <clears throat> You're focusing more maybe on the hill, uh, the, uh, the the flex, flex block. The yeah, flex block, yeah. I think, as we yep. look ahead. Yep. Um, Absolutely. Yep. And those are good. That, that's those are all very fair points. And I, you know, it, it, obviously we care very much about time on learning. So it's something that we need to really think about. Have yeah. we received any feedback from the middle school with their Hiller block and how effective? Because the I think of like the flex block as being a mm -hmm. high school version of the Hiller block. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where the, I, I was involved with the Hillebach when it was first introduced, so I don't know where it is now. But have yeah. we had any feedback from them? On not a lot. I think that's you know it, it, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I talked to Mr. Keller a little bit about that model, and some of the school council people that are on the high school council were also part of the middle school council yes. when they developed yes, that. Yeah. Uh, so I think they have some thoughts about that, um, but I haven't met with him enough to to kind of see how things are working when it comes okay. to that. Yeah. That might be that would be obviously part of our discussion. I think next year. So for next year's changes, mm -hmm. um, just regarding the semester mm -hmm. um, blend, do we have, I know you've done so much research, so I'm not suggesting that you should have had this already, but I'm just curious if we have a feel for the impact on electives. Yeah, and so right now we're running some sample schedules. Okay. Um, and so if that's going to be something that is going to be a deal breaker, then we won't, we won't go in this direction. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that was our, uh, I think, uh, only concern about going in this direction. Yeah. Uh, and so right now uh, students are starting to sign up for classes. And so based on those kind of raw numbers, we're starting to run some practice schedules to see what it would look like, to see if kids are getting the electives that they want. Yeah. Not every kid gets the what they want now anyway, right. but uh, we want to see that percentage of how many kids are getting what they want. And if that is much lower than it has been in the past, then we really need to rethink if we're going to go in this direction. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that certainly is a concern. It's Absolutely. funny because I happened to <coughs> listen to a, a radio t show today about exactly how important electives are in so, bringing and yep. keeping kids engaged yep. because they can pick those topics and I thought to you like, yeah, it was a great article in the New York Times the other day they were, that's yeah. what they were quoting yeah, yeah exactly um, um, uh, Ms. Parsons shared with me um, and the lunch schedule go oh, sorry no go ahead the lunch schedule no, I said you shared that article from the New York Times oh, with me but yeah that's exactly yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Okay. no yeah. you didn't share lunch yeah um, um, so would we be going from 25 minutes to 20 with the four lunch blocks? No, it would be the same. It was the same. It would be the same. Okay. Yeah, the concern with the fourth lunch that we've been batting around is that the fourth lunch would be off, would be really late mm. in that in that block period. So we're trying to see if we can kind of move lunches up a little bit so it's not so late in the day. Okay. Uh, but it would be the same amount of time, 20, 20 minute lunch period. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, then I would uh, seek a motion to approve the changes to the high school schedule as outlined in the agenda. For, so for 1920, right? For 19, yeah. for 2019, 20, yes. Yes, so moved. So motion by Jen, a second? Second. Second by Mina, all those in favor? Yes. Right. Yes, opposed? Did you, I didn't get. I didn't vote. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if I just didn't hear you. No, I, um, you can abstain, right? You have that option. I'm gonna abstain. Okay, so we have three in favor and one abstention. So that, um, good luck with those um, for next year and look forward Great. to hearing more about FlexBlock. So are you also presenting on um, the next item was the final overnight request for 
be very doing that. <laughs> I don't mind doing that. That's no, of course not. Oh, yeah, I, I believe Mr. Scott talked about it already. Um, he, he did. So yeah. It so just, yeah. Yep. Um, so yep. there are two overnight trips. One that I'm going. Uh, I'm very excited that I'm going to be part of, uh, which is the uh, BPA uh, trip to Anaheim. Uh, California um, the National Leadership Conference we have 11 students um, that date is um, May 1st which is a Wednesday so the students will be missing Wednesday Thursday and Friday and will be coming back early Sunday morning um, and I know he touched upon the students introduced themselves and the different projects so I'm really excited about that <coughs> mr. Scott and I will be sharing a room out in California <laughs> um, and, and the other trip is the the world robotics championship um, uh, I know that there's a middle school component but the high school teams will be heading down um, I believe the dates it's right after uh, April vacation which is the 24th which I also think is a Wednesday Thursday Friday and the students will be coming back on that Sunday so mr. Scott ha certainly has a lot of travel uh, he sure does time, he? <laughs> it was exciting to see the students here it was great tonight, yeah so. it's one it's just such a wonderful program and um, you know, it's just they, they have um, added so much uh, to the school, and um, you know we've already started to look at the numbers for next year. Those class numbers are getting so popular, and so many kids want to be part of it, and it's really exciting. And um, we've updated our banners as you come into the, the school, and we have a nice one from the robotics team up there, which we're excited about. I'll which check that out. five six years ago we didn't really have um, anything like yeah. this when it came to this, so it's really exciting. So, um, so yeah, those are the two different trips. I know I don't want to rehash all the things that he already it's talked okay. about. But. All right. So, any questions before we? I would s we'll take them separately. So the first one is to seek a, a motion to approve the overnight travel to California from May first to fifth, twenty nineteen, for the Hopkinton High School BPA. So moved. Second. Motion by Jen, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And that passes. And then the other one is I would seek a motion to approve the overnight travel to the Kentucky World Tournament April 24th to 28th, 2019 for the Hopkinton High School Robots. So moved. Motion by Jen. And second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes. And then um, the, we, we have just jump in, just and, do jump in and, well? and do the middle school one as well since we're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> So there's not really much more to say. You saw the middle school kids here tonight. Um, they will be going to Louisville, Kentucky. As Mr. Scott said, they are departing on Saturday, April 27th. They are returning on the 1st of May, and there are eight students in attendance. Okay, so the agenda says the 29th. I didn't pick up the difference. Oh, the now. actual. The actual is the that, 27th. That's a typo. So I just want to make sure. actually the 27th. Okay. Yeah. All right. So Saturday then, to Wednesday is so correct. So then is I would right? seek a motion to approve the overnight travel to the Kentucky oh. World Tournament from April. Uh, no, maybe the Saturday is the 29th. I'm sorry. The, from the, the, the form that was filled out was Mrs. Allen's form might be incorrect. So I think Saturday okay. is the 29th. Yeah, you, it's the same day. Somebody somebody calendar. Calendar. It's okay. It's, okay. Yeah, so yeah. it is there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's Saturday to Wednesday for yes. sure. Yes. Okay. The so, dates are correct. Yeah. So April 29th through May 1st, 2019. Uh, so moved. Second. Motion by Jen. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. And that is approved as well. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks thank for all of that. taking me on order. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. All right. Have a great rest of the night. I, I think you'd probably tune in at home anyway. Of course, yes. Yes, I'm going to go right home and do it. Yeah, we're streaming live. Yeah, actually, I'll rush home. <laughs> Good night. That's great. Good Thank day. you. All right. So that brings us back. Uh, we do not have student council here tonight, so that will bring us into the superintendent's report. Okay. Let me switch up. I'm linking all this green and orange tonight. Oh. Oh, you get different colors. We really, yeah. I do. Yeah. So I'll be I'll be quick. Um, so you might remember on opening day, I had shared with uh, all of the teachers. Um, that it would be a great year if all of our kids in our classrooms every day could sort of believe in that mantra, I count, I care, I can. So recently I was invited, invited to a meeting of the Eagles at the Elmwood School, and what I learned was uh, a class over there, uh, Mrs. Mortarelli and uh, Ms. Duggan, have taken all of their kids, and they not only do sort of the I count, I carry can, but they have a dance and an entire song that they have put together for this. Um, I may be sending the entire song out to all the teachers who are in the district, but she was quite lovely to send me pictures of each one of the kids doing the I count, I care, I can, and uh, perhaps at some point I will show you the entire song. Um, 
it's done to We Will, We Will Rock You, but it's, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great. It's absolutely fabulous. Uh, so this came to me from Tim Kilduff. We had 36 students who have volunteered to participate in uh, live marathon coverage, so they have all been amply trained by WBZ. Uh, not long ago, uh, I was at one of the diversity club meetings, and uh, somehow I think it was Mr. Hanna who asked the question, well, there must be a diversity month. I mean, there's a month or a diversity day for everything, and it turns out that April is diversity um, month, and so the students are entirely running this. They do something that uh, sort of illustrates their culture every single day in the month of April. So it can be anything. Uh, and they've been sort of setting up a table out there in the lobby each day. Uh, this will culminate with a uh, four different presentations from Jamil Adams. He's coming on the 29th of April. Okay. So he'll be visiting with different students and uh, according to the principal at Natick High School and the principal's daughter who attends Hopkinton High School, this should be an enormous treat for people. They say he's wonderful. Uh, on Saturday, Jen and I will be going to the Ideas Conference. Um, the keynote speaker there is Zaretta Hammond, and one of the readings that we had all done as an admin team was um, the book Culturally Responsive Teaching. So uh, we will get to see her and learn a little bit more about uh, diversity and culture and inclusivity. Yesterday, was it only yesterday? Hopkins had Katie Greer. They were two parent presentations at night mm -hmm. and a student presentation during the day. Uh, Katie Greer is sort of an expert in helping kids to better navigate all kinds of technology and social media. And I thought her presentation was really interesting. Um, she asked the kids who are not 13 how many of them were on we have Twitter, Instagram, all of those forms of social media, and almost two of one kids were putting up their hands, and then of course she asks them, how many of you are 13? And no one puts up their hands, so she reminds them that they're not protected out there. But I thought one of the other interesting things <clears throat> that she had done was she showed two pictures, and she would say, okay, who's the bad guy? And kids would just sort of base on, you know, how the face on the screen looked, and she would say, no, that's not the bad guy. This is the bad guy, and she would talk about how, you know, that person had duped people into giving uh, information, personal information via social media or doing other things. And I just thought that she was really effective. And I'm always amazed when you can have a speaker come in and talk to you know 500 kids and maintain their attention. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really good. Uh, over at the HCA, if you haven't been there yet, you should get there just to see the uh, senior artwork. Um, I just chose a couple of pieces to highlight in this presentation, but some of the stuff that's over there right now is absolutely amazing. These are the robotics and BPA kits that we saw tonight. And um, this last piece, as you know, in terms of strategic planning, we have finished working with um, Cindy Bonney, who has been our consultant, and she has put together a very lengthy report. Uh, once we go through it as an admin team, it will certainly be made public. So all of those things are being posted under strategic planning on the website. This is her draft form of what the strategic priorities might be. And of course, all of that is really based on you know, the listening tour, the entry findings report, time she has spent with the admin team, the focus groups, the district-wide survey, all of those pieces really have been put together here. One of the things I like very much that she's done with that is she's got those three topics at the top, your plan for enrollment growth, uh, valuing individual pathways and wellness and building school communities of collaboration. And then under that, she looks at those three topics in terms of how are we sort of measuring success, um, how does that factor into the diversity work that we've been doing, and how does that factor into growing communication and building better partnerships with all of our stakeholders. So again, that is, you know, if you want to take a look at that, anyone through the uh, school committee packet. I believe that Georgette has already posted it on the website. Um, and we will be sort of bringing this back 
for the 25th. And at that time, if there are folks who would like to come and dialogue about it and have that kind of public hearing, we are very well willing to invite people in to take a look at it on that day. Because this, I think, is that document that's really going to guide you know, a lot of the work that we do over the next couple of years. I mean, clearly, it's in a very bare bones and you know, kind of skeletal structure here. But I think it's, it's the beginning of where you know, we're sort of hoping to steer the ship. And that's all I've got for you, unless there are other questions. Questions? All right. Thank you. Right. I really Thank like you. this um, model that you have put oh, forth. Oh, I really here. like the way that um, came I out. I think it's uh, having it on one page is great. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I, I want to see this all in action. You know, yes. that, that's the big part that, you know, we have all these goals defined in a very, uh, you know, concise, precise mm -hmm. way. So that, that's great to have. Um, it's about translating these goals into action plan for the yes. upcoming years that you have listed out the next three years. Mm -hmm. uh, to see that translate and uh, be able to see the change at the ground level. And this is, I think, one of the things that, you know, we sort of keep talking about as an admin team. You know, it's taken us a while to get here, but I think what you're talking about in, turn a, in terms of what does this look like when it becomes an action plan, I think the real work starts now. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm also curious, is this going to be like how it was done in the previous <coughs> strategic plan, where the strategic plan was, you know, translated out into the school improvement plans? Is that how you're envisioning this as well? Yes. So there'll sort of be from this something that is at like the district level, and then each one of the principals, as they build school improvement plans, will take that same information, and hopefully, um, that kind of articulation will also help vertically, right? So what's going on at Marathon, for example, there's a logical build into Elmwood, a logical build into Hopkins. And the principals have asked if this year it would be acceptable to the school committee to see school improvement plans closer to June as opposed to, you know, in late April, which is what we usually do. And I think giving them the time to sort of digest a lot of this and, and see where that's going so that they can put together really comprehensive and thoughtful plans makes good sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So that moves us into the school committee chair report, and I'll start by saying that I have approved for the, I have approved the payroll warrant S19020 and S1920A. The payroll warrants have been included in your packet, and I have also approved the accounts payable warrants 19-084, 19-085, 19-086, 19-087, and 19-087, and the warrants have also been included in your packet. Uh, in terms of school committee office hours, we did have the opportunity to be at Hopkinton 101, and while we didn't bill it as school committee office hours, it was sort of the same uh, thing. And I, I felt like during the time I was there, it was, it, even though we were upstairs, the traffic that I saw did seem very interested in learning a little bit more about us, and it was nice to see some new faces. So I don't know if anyone else had things they wanted to bring back from what people said or more general. I think it was a great idea to participate in Hopkinton mm -hmm. 101. Um, and uh, I think just being, seeing so many community members, I know there were members who were coming, uh, you know, visiting the library or seeking out to see who all's out there. But I think even amongst the different organizations, uh, it was great to be able to connect with everybody. And, and to your point, I appreciated people walking up and talking about a few things. So a few things that stood out for me that I'd like to share. Uh, one was certainly about the technology usage that uh, we had heard. Um, well, we had also heard a little bit about, um, you know, one of the parents walked up and offered about the calendar, um, and her comment was that it looks like it's about, it's a design challenge, design space challenge. And she said she is an expert in the area and she offered to help with that. Um, so we'll be happy to pass that along to you, mm -hmm. Dr. Kavanaugh. And we shared the fact that we have the um, work upcoming in the summer and perhaps that's another opportunity to look at. Um, so that was <coughs> another aspect. We also heard, um, you know, some parents uh, with some concern with regard to the food uh, 
plan that happens in the cafeteria and we kind of directed towards that and kind of um, talking about the fact that if you don't have choices or there's sometimes a mix up kids especially the younger children um, they you know who are very sensitive to what is it that they choose to eat they may have an issue with that and they may end up um, missing their lunch and be hungry. So these are some of the comments and I, I think it was great that they felt comfortable. I think this whole idea of having office hours, Nancy, we have to give a lot of credit to you to go there and you know, parents feeling comfortable coming and talking to us. So I, I really enjoyed it and I thought you all did a fabulous job putting the flyer together. Uh, I have one, it's a little tattered from being in my bag. But, <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that was great. It was a good team effort. Uh, then next Thursday, I, I will be forwarding an invitation for everybody who is interested in going to the wreath ceremony in Boston uh, that we have been in, invited to as a group. So I will forward that. It's related to the Greek consulate in the marathon. Then I have uh, last week. I'm trying. I'm mixing up my days. So we did meet with appropriations. I know that um, that was. But before the appropriations meeting, Mina and I had met with the um, chair and vice chair of the Board of Selectmen and some members of the board, uh, Appropriations Committee, the town manager, Dr. Kavanaugh and Susan, uh, to talk about uh, the legacy farms mitigation money. And I just wanted to give just a quick update on where that is. You know, on September 7th, we had sent out the letter about our enrollment that had triggered the first $500,000 payment, which has come into the town. But as you guys are aware, the uh, $500,000 is not currently under the control of the school committee because there's some ambiguity in the language of the HCA. So we're looking at uh, not just that $500,000 because we, as we know, we have hit other thresholds that will make us be eligible for additional payments from legacy farms uh, in mitigation money, which will come at the end of the school year when they look at the enrollment again. Uh, so there were two, two issues being discussed. One is the $500,000 payment, which is currently in the town, and kind of how to get that to the schools to be used. And it, that $500,000 is a little bit different because it already has been paid. So that's looking like it's going to go into a stabilization fund uh, at town meeting. And then we will have access to it through the stabilization fund. Stabilization funds are a little bit different than money that we have typically that like when we've had to make appropriations in here where we just vote them. A stabilization fund requires a two-thirds vote at town meeting so that we're not going to be able to just, if we have an emergency need, we're not just able to say, hey, we need that, let's vote for it. We have to actually have it line up with a town meeting. So that brings us to the next point is the additional payments that will be coming forward. The It appears the only legal way for the school committee to maintain control of the funds is perhaps to have a trust set up in which the school committee members would be a trustee. So our attorneys are trying to work that out to figure out what would be honoring both the spirit of the host community agreement uh, and also uh, meeting the letter of the law and all of that. So that's where that stands. So we will, I will bring this back so that we can discuss at our April 25th meeting, since it's not on our agenda tonight. Uh, potential uses that we'd like to have for that uh, and talk about how we want to spend the money and kind of give an update at that point because I expect by April 25th we should have some clarity on what the disposition of the funds is going to be. That is all I have tonight. So I feel like unless there are any other questions we can move, move into our liaison reports. Does anyone have any liaison reports? I, yeah, I have a few. I'll go. Um, so the first thing is uh, we had the community communication group meeting, which which was great. And one of the things that uh, that the group has decided to work on is a town wide volunteer needs page. And we've talked through a little bit about the legalities and you know where should it be hosted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but right now we're talking about a simple page. And we reached out to Dr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Bishop to see if this could be taken up by high school students as a project and trying to foster, um, you know, bringing the schools in the community together. And I was very happy to see that in the strategic plan as well. And Dr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Bishop both felt absolutely we can, uh, 
you know, throw that out and see if any kids are interested uh, with the target date of December 2019. So that's one thing that's going on. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring back as part of CCG to Amanda and perhaps Mr. Ghosh is in the past two months, we were kind of in a flex of where we are as a group and formation and whatnot. But the next two months, April and May, if you two would like to come and present um, to us either either this month, end of this month, or next month, that would be great okay. to come and talk about the website. I know that's pending. Um, the other uh, part is um, I, at the last legislative update meeting I had brought up something about gifted education and where we are with it and asking a little bit uh, with both our uh, uh, state president Spelka as well as Representative Dykema. Representative Dykema's office got back to me and they talked about the fact that you know the Department of Education has funded a study on gifted education and programming statewide. So some um, preliminary results are available and there is going to be a conversation, a open public forum um, on May 8th. There is one at Shrewsbury Town Hall in the afternoon, and there is one uh, that very day in the evening at Framingham Public Library. This is on May 8th. I can share the exact details. Uh, you know, I certainly plan to go, and I would love for anyone else who's interested to go as well. Um, the other one, you know, my, uh, small stuff, you know, nothing major yet, but on the agenda front, the process front, Nancy and I have been working and looking at it. I've done a first draft of how we can get items on the agenda for the school committee processes part. So we are going to be reviewing it shortly and hopefully bring back at the next meeting for all of you to take a look at. Okay. I think that's about it. Yeah. I have one. Thank you, Mina, for... Uh, generously offering to have me take over for you for planning board. I went to the planning board meeting uh, last Monday. There were about 50, 60 people that came to that planning board meeting. So it was a really nice trial by fire. Thank you. Um, but sort of relevant to our work um, was um, Amy Ritterbush and Deb Feinberg presented a uh, one year growth restriction citizens petition. And that sparked quite a bit of conversation, which was good. Um, and multiple <coughs> references were made to the schools by many members of the community, including um, some folks from other boards, but also folks who just came to, to, to sort of speak their piece. So, so after listening for about half an hour, I thought I think I might need to get up there and say something since the schools have been brought up so many times, unprepared. Um, so uh, one of the big things that came out of that meeting I'm glad you said was uh, Frank Durso mentioned how that you know the schools are waiting on this $500,000 to sort of help mitigate the costs from the increased growth that we've experienced in our schools, um, and I think you know I sort of reiterated yes we are one of many departments that feel this and, and we need to make sure that we're taking care of the police and the fire and the DPW and and um, so it was a good conversation and ultimately they did vote not to support this article. Um, on the warrant, but um, w hopefully what came out of the conversation was like, this is not a new mm. situation. This is not something that happened last week or even last year. This is something that we knew was coming. And so um, the, the, one of the reasons they voted it down was that there's a process in place in order to help reduce the pace of growth, not necessarily restrict it. And um, so folks wanted to honor that process, which I completely agree, but I, my question to them was, well, when does that process start? Does, to, does it start today? Does it start tomorrow after this mm -hmm. meeting? Like, when is the start date? Um, because one of the off-the-cuff, you know, conversations were about um, how long it might take in order to get this process going, and you know, it was stated one to three years, and I was like, <laughs> I have to. <laughs> That's going to be too long. We're going to have 400 new kids in three years, and we're going to need to, you know, mm -hmm. deal with this before we have those 400 students join our schools. So, um, so hopefully, this, even though the um, the support from the planning board 
they opted not to support this petition, I think that hopefully it got the conversation going mm -hmm. so that folks are more aware of our situation, not just here in the schools, but across the town. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to welcome folks when they move in, but we want to make sure that we have the resources available to the new folks when they get here and for, for all the existing town people too. So yeah, it was a, it was a doozy. <laughs> it was a good one. Thank you for taking it to our Absolutely. Yes, I'm a little jealous to hear they're getting 50 or 60 people it at their meetings. <laughs> Standing room only. Standing room only, yeah. Although we are happy to great. have a member here tonight. I know. Right. We appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Is it? Are you good? Good. Good. Got um, it. The website team, the project team under Mr. Ghosh, they're working very hard. There now is now is a sprint time for them um, as they work very very hard to um, with the vendor to come up with our new site. Um, like about mm. 20 minutes before I came here, I think I got an email from Mr. Ghosh saying we've received the first very rough mock-up of what. Um, the home page might look like given um, this is a first pass and it was given the inputs that um, the team gave him in terms of what menuing we wanted and so forth so um, he has just received that uh, we have three iterations of review and respond with this um, home page and the website subcommittee is going to meet on Monday night at 630 to um, provide as a subcommittee our feedback and our response to this so um, that is an open meeting. If anyone wants to come, feel free. It's posted on the website. So, um, but they are working really hard, and I think um, I'm imagining that soon on the horizon will be uh, requests for content from administrators and and so forth from us. From I mean, as as they as the design takes shape, it's going to turn to content. Um, so we'll see where that is. But I will definitely talk to Mr. Ghosh about um, bring going together with the community calendar and bring an update that would be great it's um, so the next one is on Friday April 26th at 10 a.m. Okay. and the next one is on Wednesday May 29th at 7 p.m. Okay. Um, we'll shoot for the April one so okay. that if there's great. any calendaring issue sure. Sure. Um, we can go through that yes sounds good mm -hmm. so um, and just quickly I liaison and liaison to the hop coalition and just sharing that they are planning a celebration of recovery the first ever for Hoppington. There are many families in our town who have been touched by substance abuse and uh, many people who are working really hard every day in recovery and um, we're celebrating that. And it's we're sort of taking a model that Natick used and some other towns have used and we're hosting an event on, it'll be on the Common from 12 to 4 on, on Saturday, May 4th. And it'll be just um, music and food and celebration and there will be a, um, Recovery, I'm gonna name of it, commemorative garden. We'll say we're gonna, you can plant a flag for someone that you know who's battling every day, or um, you can honor someone who may have lost the battle. So there will be, um, if you go to the event, great, it's open to everybody. And if you don't go but you drive by the common and you see some flags after May 4th, you'll know why. So. Nice, we're at a place where we're looking to having events on the town common again. Yeah. All right, that uh, moves us into our new business. Uh, first item is the Hopkins School Gift Account. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, we have three gift account um, things here. So the first mm -hmm. one is that Sager Sports has um, offered a check to Hopkins Elementary in the amount of $292, and we simply need for you to approve the acceptance of that gift. Okay. So is there a motion to approve the acceptance of the $292 gift? So moved. Second. Second. Motion by Mina, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Okay. Right. And that passes, and that moves us into the next gift account. Okay. So this is, once again, Hopkins Elementary School. And this gift is coming from Spiritware, and it's in the amount of $475. They did well. They did. Oops. So Hold on for a sec. Is it 472 or 475? Oh, please hold. I will look at what the check itself says. Oh, well, that's the problem right there. We had to do math to figure <laughs> out the answer, right? Uh, I'll get my little calculator out here. We, we would have it right here, right? Hopkins gift account for the PDFs. It's checks, yeah. individual checks that we have. Okay. Oh. Oh. Just to resolve, the, there are two in the agenda. There's... Two different numbers listed. One says 475. 
And that's got a different number. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I missed a whole page. Did you get a third number? I we did. got a third number. Okay, now. <laughs> so 292 is from Sager Sports, yes? Anyone want to offer a song or dance for our room audience? <laughs> no, I just had it and then it disappeared again. Do we have three? We have one for 142 and one for 475. So you think that 475 must be correct? Yes. Okay. okay. So we, I would seek a motion then to accept the donation totaling $475 for the Hopkins Elementary gift account. So moved. Motion by Mina, a second. Second. By Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. It's unanimous and so carries, and that moves us into the donation from the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Yes, so you will all remember that at our last meeting, um, Chuck Rockwood came and he was awarded $250 from the VFW, and we simply need to formalize that by accepting that gift. Okay, so seek a motion to accept the $250 donation for the Charles Rockwood Fund. <coughs> so moved. Second. A motion by Mina and a second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. yes. And it is unanimous and so carries. We have already done the Hopkinton High School changes and the final overnight travel requests for the BPA robotics and the middle school robotics. So that brings us down to old business, which starts with the 2019 to 2020 school calendar, page two. Yes. So you will remember we had a conversation about adding a second page that we were hoping would be reflective of all the holidays and observances within the community. Uh, we posted that on the website for feedback, and we did actually have some folks give us some uh, additional days that they would have liked to be added. And so that's what we've done, and what you see here has been posted for some time now, and I think that um, in terms of the community, they are satisfied with this list. So I am simply wondering if you would like to approve this page to be added to the 2019-2020 school calendar. So before um, before we have a motion, I had Meg had anticipated she would not be here at this point and had okay. sent me something to read. So this is her words that I'm going to read. She said, I am very pleased that our new calendar is attempting to be inclusive. We have a community that is rich in its differences and united in its common aim to better the lives for our children. I look forward to the school school calendar committee discussions that will take place this summer. And that's Meg. Um, I just have a few thoughts. Um, I am also very excited to see that, you know, we are looking to be inclusive and have a much bigger list here. I do think that there are other holidays and, you know, the community may, may not have participated at the moment for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. I know we have um, uh, community members who follow Buddhism or Jainism. So we're still not seeing them here, probably because they have not participated. I was wondering if the committee feels open to the idea of leaving this open. We don't have to necessarily approve it, right? We ha the main calendar was the approval, and this is the addendum, which is listing all these holidays for observances. So tom or even tomorrow, if someone else comes with another holiday that they observe, and they want to bring that up to you. Uh, perhaps that's a consideration to keep it open. Is there any reason why we need to uh, close it? I, I mean, you have to formalize the first page of the calendar <clears throat> that indicates when kids are in school and out of school. So I think that you have the flexibility to do whatever as a committee you choose with this sheet. So my one question, and I'm open to leaving it you know, open for, for a set period of sure. time. Um, if we use this to give to faculty so mm -hmm. that they can be sensitive to a student's participation in a holiday, I feel like we need to have it like done by a day so that we can say mm -hmm. to the faculty, here are the dates that you need to be sensitive to students. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just don't want it to be after the fact that a child comes in and says, I was home celebrating and it wasn't on their list. Um, 
you know, I, I feel like we have to have a day that we say, here's our calendar for next year. Teachers, try to be sensitive and mindful of this. Don't give tests and papers due on this day if possible. Um, and then, you know, as the count, as we work on it over the summer, we can integrate more if we need to integrate more holidays. Um, I don't know. I don't know what time, what day would be a good cutoff, but you're right. We don't have a, this isn't like a sensitive time document. Right. Right. Uh, right. Other than making sure the faculty have it in time for next year when they, the they whole point is to be sensitive to the Right. The right. And, and exactly, you know, I hear what you're saying that we do want to give some kind of a guidance and right. give the community an opportunity. Uh, but, uh, I don't know you know, all the mechanisms. I know you sent a mail out and there was a survey out and I know we all reached out to community members. Um, at the same time, I'm not seeing the, at least the couple of ones that I'm talking about or even, um, you know, even um, things like holy or some of the other things that I see. Uh, so I don't know what's the best mechanism is. If you have some thoughts, um, it's okay either which way. Could we even do it this summer? Could we wait and do it this summer when we meet? Because as long as we have something to give to the faculty by the fall. Yeah, I mean, you can and entirely put this I, on hold. Yeah. So, and I believe there was somebody, and I can't remember the exact language, but I could get it back, about the uh, Jewish observances, yes. the second part about observant Jews. There was something else that was better to add to that. I remember that as well. It was. About denominations. The, just the language. It, the language around observant Jews exactly. versus denominations. Yeah. And I, okay. I can get that from the individual who. It was community feedback. I think it went to you and you shared or we came to the group committee. It, I think it actually was on social media, but oh, so I, I picked right. it up there and I would like to circle back to that person who okay. I had thought was. And the other one. Provide it directly. other one was the three stars and it didn't have a note for some reason. Evacuation. Oh, the third star disappeared. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So, All right, we'll have to figure um, that out. Too. When are we, where do we stand with launching the calendar committee? When is, the, like, are we looking to start that in June, or when is our, when is the target? I would say we would probably start looking for folks in late, in late May. Okay. And begin the work after school gets out. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was the question? When launching we were targeting to, to get this work underway on yeah. the calendar for the following year, since obviously we've set the actual calendar. Yeah. Um, but then we could maybe. Yes. Is are you comfortable with bringing that back? Oh sure. Over yeah. the summer. Right. I mean, if we're still, if we want to continue to kind of work on this document, I'm fine with that. I think I it's agree okay with to what Jen has said about having it prepared for the fall, because the real goal is to get it into the hands of faculty and staff, so that they sort of have an understanding of who are the kids sitting in front of them and what do they celebrate. I think it's okay to have on the website as it is for now. I don't. And, correct me if anybody disagrees and just with the expectation that we can go back yeah. so that just so that it shows folks that we are this is a work and you can even put draft on it or something if you mm -hmm. so choose or not if you don't but so people can see we're working on this and yeah. come back to it and we vote it I would also like to see no rose added that's a push in holiday um. so if there are any that people would like to add if you just email Georgette she can get them on there Sure. All right. Nice work. That feels like um, Thank you. we have, or I should say specifically, you have made some good progress on yeah, shifting this. This is looking good. Yeah. Better. That's great. Yeah. I just, um, I just have to say, it, when we think about the committee, there are some really good resources out there that if, you know we've talked about from other districts who have given nice um, descriptions to what these holidays are, which is, it's, a, it's sort of a lovely guide to. Mm sort of different customs and I'm hoping that the committee when the, the calendar and committee can consider ways that we can describe you know going forward and maybe Page it's three. through the online calendar maybe we put some descriptive text in there or something mm -hmm. it is a good point it's a nice way to be able to see what exactly but beyond the name yeah and, and Dr. Kavna I know we just you know I've thrown out some holidays here but I'm thinking that uh, you know, obviously, I don't know the mm -hmm. entire communities, you know, who all celebrates what all. And I'm just wondering how much research we should do from our end versus relying on the community to tell us. Should we be proactive in looking at our demographic and saying, you know, what's the biggest holiday at least? 
uh, the general idea and putting it out there? <coughs> or should we be waiting for people to tell us? Well, I think I have no way of knowing what the demographic is. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we you don't, don't ask. ask kids what kind, you know, anything about their religion or their faith or, or those kinds of things. That's just information we don't have. Okay. We aren't allowed to collect that, that's my guess. It's not something yeah, that we have interest in, but yeah. I would think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but I know that Georgia did mm -hmm. send something out to every family asking about this. So if, you know, and maybe sometimes just word of mouth is a good way sure. to kind of get folks to look again at the at the list. And I know right. people are busy, and we get hundreds mm -hmm. of emails. So when they come, people sometimes put them on the back burner or say, yeah. It goes know. down the scrolling list, and when well, it gets to when, page two, it's yes. dead. Yeah. And, and I know Meg mentioned at least twice, if not thrice, about Karl Marx's birthday. So I'm just throw, sure. throwing it out there. I didn't know if she was serious or not. I, I have no idea. So, Straight up. I don't know that that's a recognized holiday. I don't know. Um, all right, so that moves us into uh, the transportation audit report. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as you know, we embarked on a review of our transportation process yeah. and all things in, encompassing. Um, it's always good to have an outside look and kind of check back with what other districts are doing, what um, our best practices, um, just really kind of look at everything that is out there. So the review process. Mm -hmm. okay, take it out. We're just thinking we might need another plug, but I think Jen will have them when she comes need. back. I've got this. Oh, she's got them. Jen comes back. I'll grab hers. Okay. You can keep going. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, um, so Jen has one. Yeah, Dr. I think Kemner. we can have one. Oh, okay. I think we have the same. So the review process, just to give you an idea, so the team came, they spent two days on site to gather data. Uh, they performed interviews with the superintendent, director of finance, assistant principals, student services, Connolly Bus, who is our current provider, and the transportation coordinator. They did on-site observations of both the morning and afternoon buses for the middle of school and high school, and on-site observation of the afternoon buses for Hopkins, Elmwood, and Marathon. They also did ride-along observations for some of our challenging roads, the growth areas, and some of our bus stop locations. The objectives that were defined uh, for them to be looking at are as follows. So first, investigate possible transportation cost savings, which would be due to change in the size of the school bus fleet, elimination of bus routes, changes in school start times, and or school bus tiering. Two, investigate the impact that the reduction of bus stops would have upon the current transportation costs. Three, provide comprehensive explanation of best practice operational procedures, which could be adopted by the district in order to improve efficiency and save money for the district. Fourth uh, objective, investigate the impact of student transportation changes upon in-district special education transportation after school activities and special runs. Five, to review bid specs in order to assure that they meet the needs of the district and are up to date regarding any new regulatory requirements. And lastly, to investigate if necessary, the possibility of <coughs> reconfiguring traffic and parking in order to improve bus drop-off procedures and ensure that buses, staff, students, student drivers, and parents arrive safely <coughs> and during the same time sequence. So in their discovery, and as a reminder to everyone, um, current conditions, Hopkinton is 28.2 square miles. In terms of growth, there's currently 591 building units as of February 2019 that do not have occupancy permits. And Hayden Row and West Main Street are used as a Route 495 bypass. As anyone knows, when something happens on 495, everyone floods these roads. <coughs> and in the future, the downtown corridor undergrounding project could take two to three years of construction. So just to give a little review, um, 
and these are some of the things that when they do their root analysis and also for the general public to understand in terms of our roots. When you look at the timing between the middle school and high school, and then Hopkins and then Elmwood Marathon, between middle school and high school and then getting to Hopkins, there's only 30 minutes of available time for those routes. From Hopkins to the Elmwood Marathon, there's 35 minutes. And then Elmwood Marathon being the end of the day, you do have that full 60 minutes. Um, some of the constraints when you look at our routes, the highest student count, so if you look at middle school and high school, we have one run that has 64 students and they're all dropped off in six stops. And that run only takes 15 minutes. On the other side of that, we have another run that has 55 students with 19 stops, and that run takes 28 minutes. And that's 28 minutes of run time. That's not the time it takes to get back to the school. So you have to remember with 30 minutes of time, that 28 minutes now has to travel back and get to Hopkins. The lower counts, and these are some of the things that you hear is um, statements that can be made in, in uh, the community. One of the routes has 37 students, and it takes 13 stops, but it takes 25 minutes. So again, it is a very low occupancy, but you don't have time to get any more students on that bus. Another, another run has 43 students with nine stops and 23 minutes. And again, that leaves seven minutes to get back to the schools. So you can see how that plays out in the, the rest. Um, going to the other side, Elmwood Marathon, the high counts, there are 71 students, 14 stops, that takes 49 minutes. And then on the low side, and this is one that people will really wonder, there are 23 students 16 stops, so you can imagine this is on those long, windy roads. Almost every student has their own stop, and that run takes 50 minutes. So you're right up against that time. This is very helpful, Ms. Rathamik. Um, you know, just kind of having that perspective that you may have a smaller number of students in the bus, but then if you have that route with so many stops, that's the reason why. Uh, it's designed that way. That's correct. Um, and it, it's extremely painful to see our youngest learner arriving home so late. It's a huge, huge, uh, you know, it's very difficult. They're kindergartners that we are talking about sometimes coming an hour after they've gotten on the bus. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing this. So to take you through one by one, um, basically what the objective was, what their findings were, and what their recommendations were, if, if there were some. So the first one, investigate possible transportation cost savings due to the change in size of the bus fleet, elimination of bus routes, school start times, and or tiering. Their findings, each school bus route covers the entire town, and again, this gets back to that geography as opposed to neighborhood schools, which you do see in other towns, they would have bus routes that would cover just a smaller geographical area. So that was one of their findings. A reduction in school bus tiers, meaning looking at just the elementary schools all being on the same time, would actually not result in cost savings due to a need actually for more buses. The traffic and geographical distance are an issue and additional buses would likely be required in the future as opposed to reductions due to growth. The next objective, investigate the impact the reduction of bus stops would have on current transportation costs. The route analysis showed careful consideration was given to each bus route and bus stop. Suggestion to create walking zones that are not serviced by bus routes. Further consolidation of bus stops where possible, which would really be within a neighborhood. And the routing software that is utilized is um, being utilized with efficiency. Next, to provide a comprehensive explanation of best practice. Um, students should be allowed one seat in the morning and one seat in the afternoon on bus routes. Allowing students multiple seats negatively impacts safety, efficiency, and accountability. 
the transportation policy and procedures are clear and concise, infrequent problems with behavior of students on the bus. They offered some suggestions for driver training, and we are in compliance with student training for school bus safety. Next was to impact, excuse me, investigate the impact of student transportation changes upon in-district special education <laughs> transportation after school activities and special runs. They acknowledge that um, working with a collaborative actually is the, the best case in terms of efficiency and cost savings for a school district and they said offered to continue to work with accept um, and that again the driver shortage was noted as being one of the difficulties that accept is having. Review the bid specifications in order to assure they meet the needs of the district. Um, their findings are that the bid document is comprehensive. They did offer additional legal language. They noted that the school bus driver shortage um, is a national issue. And there was also a suggestion to create in-house ownership of the transportation fleet. And lastly, to invest investigate if necessary the possibility of reconfiguring traffic and parking um, they did notice when they went to observe all of the um, um, buses that there was concern for parent drop-off at the middle school and high school area uh, they noted when physical space exists school bus drop-off and pickup should be clear of all other <coughs> traffic and they also offered support for the future um, school bus parking lot So that um, basically outlines kind of what their research found. They offered some suggestions. Um, the committee can decide whether these suggestions are action items or um, what to do with it. We, I will certainly be looking at the legal, legal language of the contract when the contract is up um, and review if any of that language is something that needs to be inserted into our current contract. Ms. Rathmik, sorry. Go ahead. Go. Uh, did they have an opportunity to look at, I know in the detailed documentation, they talked about some challenges around dismissal when, you know, you have large numbers of kids trying to get them on the bus and what have you. I remember uh, that conversation from last year, I believe, when, uh, you know, there was this conversation to have just one stop, pick one in the evening, <coughs> right? Um, and. Uh, Mrs. Carver, Mrs. Dubow, and uh, Mrs. Bilal over here, and they had talked about the challenges during dismissal of getting the kids on the appropriate buses. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that was thrown out at that time was, could we utilize technology in some way in managing some of that internally? Um, so I don't know if that's on the radar at all, if that could possibly bring some efficiency. Uh, something f uh, for you to consider perhaps so there is technology that will allow you to track who is on the bus mm -hmm. but for an elementary school they need to know who to put on that bus mm -hmm. um, so when when the buses are driving around you hear very frequently over the walkie-talkie uh, Joey's on my bus today and he's not supposed to be right but we could track who is on that bus mm -hmm. But it's the schools need to know that, oh, Joey's Monday, you go to this bus. Oh, Joey, on Tuesday, you go to that bus. There isn't technology that's going to tag Joey to get him on that bus. It's a person. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, perhaps this is something to talk about a little bit in uh, detail in the sense that uh, one of the areas that I worked on personally is understanding the business process as one would call it, right? So what is the process that's being followed there in uh, when the kids are getting on the bus? And using technology in certain key points that would alleviate the problem. So I don't think that we can ever replace a human. However, the error if you have a handheld device, because technology and hardware has become so cheap these days, I wonder if there is something available easily outside or if this could be built where you have a handheld device. And you know, I know they talked about last minute changes coming up. 
So you can take a look at it, but you have to first understand the process there. Because some of it is so, they have been doing it for years, which is a set pattern that's out there. But you can look at a business process and see where is it that you can bring technology. So I'm just throwing it out there as you're looking at all of this. This is something we had talked about last year. If that's a possibility uh, to look at, perhaps we can talk about it a little bit if there is any interest. If well, I mean, I, they do have a complete log sheet of who is supposed to be on what bus and on what day. I see. Okay. So it, it is done electronically. I see. Um, the other question I had for you was, I, I know you didn't bring that up, I don't recall saying that, was something around districts. They talked about if there are um, districts, it would be easier. Could you speak to that a little bit, please? So there's, there's different models, and, and um, we've talked about how there's a challenge because we're a K-1 school, then a 2-3 school, and a 4-5 school, where if you go to another town, you may have this section of school. This section of town is K-5. to It's a neighborhood school. This section of town is K-5. to It's a neighborhood school. So that's what they were talking about. So if you have neighborhood schools, geographically the buses only have to cover that area mm. whereas if it's a 2 3 school they have to cover the entire the entire town so there's just different structures that could be looked at and that was just one of the suggestions that they had in terms of looking at a different structure i would have a lot of concern i just want to put that out there if we're bringing up the word districting cuz that has a um, a very strong it's evocative in town for people having very strong feelings. I don't feel like where we've just built the Marathon School as a K-1 and there was a lot of mistrust early on in the process that there was going to be a bait and switch, that somehow Marathon was actually going to become a K-5 school. So I want to be very careful in how we're having the discussion that that's not the actual discussion that we're proposing. We're not proposing changing our schools to K-5 no, schools. And, and that's, yeah, so that is just one, <coughs> one of the models and being yeah. a reviewer, they bring the perspective of different towns. So right, right. That was just one of the things that they pointed out. And again, it's it's something the committee could choose to act on, discuss, or not. Right. Yeah. So, like I said, I was surprised to see that as one of their recommendations. And I wondered, don't you have to see how the student population is spread across before you make a recommendation from a transportation standpoint related to that? Well, you, you would make those decisions, but again, it would be up to the committee to decide to embark on that conversation at all. Okay. If I, I mean, what they present, I mean, I, we had to do this, and I think I'm, got, I'm glad we did this, but it's hard to get a report that's filled with things that we've discussed so much over the last mm -hmm. five years and have either implemented, like the parking lot, or have thrown out like the neighborhood schools, or um, you know, last year we brought up the transportation policy, what you were talking about, and and we had, you know, a revolving door of folks from the community expressing their concern about those changes. So I, I, I think that's the hard part about this. These results are that they're just not helpful because we've already <laughs> done the one thing that may help us, which is the bigger buses in the parking lot and the other things we've already looked at over and over and over and, and not to say that we can't revisit them of course we can but but you know folks in town have expressed their their concerns about changing the transportation policy and folks in town have expressed their concerns about neighborhood schools and the long ride times I feel like fewer stops definitely neighborhood stops I, I think that's a, a good potential solution but I know folks in town have expressed their concerns over having their child not picked up in their driveway. So you know we've we've got a um, a list of suggestions that we've already looked at in the two short, very short period of time that I've been here. So I mean I think you know that's the the tough part about this is as I read the the long version, I, I kept thinking. I'm, we needed to do this. I'm glad we did this, but why did we do this? Because this is just not helpful. You know, their suggestions are appreciated, but. But already, yeah, yeah. we are going to have to consolidate stops right, for exactly. next year. I mean, yes. that's, right. the consolidating so, stops will happen for next year because okay. we will never get kids home in under an hour's time. Right. That that fifty. Yeah. 
five minutes or whatever that number was is already so pushing. Yeah. If we have extra students to drop off, it seems like. Yes. And that's such a long, like Mina said, it's such a long ride for those little guys, it kindergartners, yeah. coming home an hour later, you know, and they can't eat while they're waiting in line, and they can't eat on the bus, and they're starving because right. they haven't eaten yeah. since 12 o'clock. So yeah, it's, I know, we'll, we'll hear about that too. Do we know if we consolidate stops, if, is there any concern over unsafe walking paths to get to stuff? I mean, I know even within neighborhoods, especially in the winter, I and mean, we don't clear our sidewalk, you know, it's, it's difficult. Is there any, um, I mean, Hopkinton's tricky. We have so many wide, winding roads. There's probably a limit to how much we can even consolidate. But mm -hmm. is there any um, thought that we might have to invest, we school or we town, in sidewalks or safe walking routes? So we, we did say that if we were consolidating, it would be within neighborhoods that do, in fact, have sidewalks. Okay. Um, and we agreed that if it's a very windy country road that doesn't have sidewalks, that we would continue to pick up at students' homes. Uh, we don't want to put any students in jeopardy, but you know it may mm -hmm. require the kids are going to walk, you know, from the bus stop to the home. And one of the things that we say in our policy all the time is that um, it is the parent's responsibility to get a child safely to the bus stop. Um, and we try to be sensitive to families' needs, but if we, you know, take a look at that slide where we see we have 23 kids and 16 stops, you know, just by consolidating, if we had 23 kids and 11 stops, for example, we might be in a much better place. Although that might not be the best example, because my guess is that will take you very, very far away from our schools and probably through yeah. some windy yeah. roads. I, I would uh, echo exactly what you said. I felt sort of the same way. But I, there are a couple uh, small things I picked up on. Um, I think they highlighted a, a one mile, um, illegally by the state, a one mile distance is acceptable for walking. Walking zone. And I just personally, you know, when we're looking at consolidating stops, I like a half mile. I mean, I think a half mile is a reasonable mm -hmm walk to a bus stop. There aren't any sidewalks <laughs> within a mile. Yeah, I, I don't know. Right yeah, I'm not Even sure. I don't think we use we, the we one use mile. That, we use the half mile. I thought we did. I just wanted to mm -hmm. check that because I yeah, saw we that. We do and a, walk zone, nice, a half mile walk zone. Is that we? Yeah, we, we, you can have up to a mile, but for the most part, when we're designing routes, we're, we look to the half mile. So if somebody lives within a half mile of the school, in the K to six, do they? Oh, no, so we we don't have a walk zone where we, the walk zone. What they were suggesting is, don't pick up with the bus. That's that's what I mean. We do not have. We have a hundred percent bus service. So if you live 0.25 from the school and wish to get picked up by a bus, we pick you up. Your predecessor was a a proponent of a walk zone, and I don't recall exactly why we did not move forward with that. I I think. A, it might be worth looking into, I would say, a smaller buffer if kids are walking to a bus, t to get to the bus stop within a certain number of, you know, however far it is, it would make sense that if you live within that far of the school, it might make sense to look into. I'm not committing that that's definitely what I would want, but it would be something to look into the pros and cons. I think the danger of too far away from the school is that you're then going to have all those kids driving. I mean, the parents driving. Right. I was also reading, you know, uh, related, but I don't know if it's really helpful with the costs or what have you, is Holliston is trying um, some uh, a promotion or asking kids to walk up to schools. We do that in it a certain point as well, I think. It, it's They're doing it one day a week, I think, right? Uh, that's right. And in the throughout the yeah. summer to say, you know, uh, there's a word that they have for it, some bus rides, walking bus rides, I think is what they're walking calling bus, it. Right. It's a walking bus. It's all part of initiative. It's called Safe Routes to School. Mm. Um, and so basically what it is, is it is an encouragement for students to walk and not take the bus. Mm -hmm. um, so, but again, like, Right now, we do not have that as a policy that, you know, within the two miles of school, you, you know, that's a walk zone and the, and the bus will not service. We don't have that as a policy right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. I, I guess not having those, path, you know, walkways is a huge challenge. The, the Safe so to School program, I mean, I, I really like that program for the physical and mental benefits of, of that exercise, but in our town, 
we are con constricted just because we don't have that kind of a walkable town right now. Mm -hmm. um, just I had a couple of those um, small things. The special ed van that we have and the one that we have uh, proposed, and if the, if that's accepted and then we have, so we have two, can we park them with the buses? That was the suggestion that they made. Yes. Will we be doing that? There'll be room for that. Yeah, they could, they could, they can park down there. There's room. Okay. And do we need to have cleaning facilities for the buses? I saw in their addendum a reference to garaging. Any, thought, any service gosh. that needs to be done for the buses, which would include cleaning, they, yeah. they would take it to a Connolly okay. location. That's good. Um, and the other, there was a, a reference in their document about student <laughs> discipline and connecting with the vice principals. And it seemed like our vice principals were requesting more timely notification of uh, discipline issues. I don't know what we do currently. But I was just wondering if there was any action to take there, where it seems like they were our principals were eager to be the first point of contact. Yeah, so there, there is a process in place. Um, and what and is that? How and is the drivers. So they, if there is a student behavior, they'll get two verbal warnings, and then if it continues, they'll have a conduct slip, and the conduct slip is given to the vice principals, and then it is taken up with the student and the parent. So the process exists. It came out in, the, in their findings. I wasn't sure if yeah, the I, vice principals were looking for any improvements. That's all. If we could do it electronically. Yeah. Or if there's... So it, and now, in talking with the vice principals after the report came out, they're very satisfied with the process that we have. Okay. Yeah, and I know that we are getting into busing season, and there will be parents who will be calling and sort of asking for, you know. Uh, I guess they would like to take exceptions to the policy in their own individual places and because they have extenuating circumstances. But I think that they need to know that now with just, you know, 3,750 kids in the district, like those exceptions are probably going to have to, you know, be no's. You know what I mean? I, I think that um, we've tried to accommodate as many as we can, but it just becomes very difficult to, you know, sort of make an exception for one family and then tell four others no. So. Um, you know. Is this like for bus switching? Is that what you're? Yes. So what will happen, for example, is you have your home bus. It's you know where you are in the morning, and um, for example, so you know you might be able to travel to a daycare. You can travel to a family member's home, but we can't just have you going to well I go with the neighbor on Monday and you know my mother's best friend on Tuesday. And we do have a lot of those requests, and we do have to follow the. It's got to be a family member or a daycare you know, in approved daycare. So, you know, it gets tough at this time of year, but I think for the safety of kids, you know, if you ever saw a dismissal, um, and I know that we say, could we streamline this with electronics or whatever, but if I'm the classroom teacher and I am also the person who watches bus line 18, uh, that bus line changes every single day, and sometimes it changes at 2.30. Right, and I'm putting the kids on the bus at 3:15, so um, it does get very tricky at the end of the day. Did Did they highlight any? I mean, they've sort of referenced best practices, and it just seems like, as as Jen said, the recommendations are things that we've considered. I mean, we are thinking about this all the time. Is there any town that's kind of held up as a gold standard in this? Is are there is there any anywhere to look where? I mean, it's just such an, a difficult problem. Is there anywhere that they've cited? Well, I would say that one thing we are is rare in the opportunities we afford families. Um, and Susan may be able to get us this data uh, through, you know, her listserv. But there are towns that will say, you get a home bus. You are picked up at home and you are dropped off at home. We don't do anything special around that. Or there are some communities that will say you can have an AM bus and a PM bus. We really do afford families a whole lot more than that. And you know, it gets very, very confusing at the end of the day. And I know that was a source of angst for you know, the several parents who came to see us last time. But um, just in terms of safety and efficiency, it is very difficult to do what we're currently doing. Well, if I, do you mind if I jump no, in? No, jump in. Um, so having lived at Center School for seven <laughs> years of five and six-year-olds and what that looked like at the end of the day, um, it's a really very overwhelming time and um, Jen I completely agree with you when you look at some of the recommendations that it's very frustrating and I feel like busing and transportation and all of these complex issues I don't know that there's any great answer because every district does struggle but then it, I guess it does make me think about 
is there something in here that's manageable? So you're right, like redistricting, that's not, it's, it's not, not a conversation right now, but it, the way I look at it, is there anything in there that might be plausible? So having left center, I went to an elementary school of 250 students with, I don't know, we had maybe eight buses at the end of the day, and we had K to five. And you would think that, oh, your third, fourth, and fifth graders know what's happening at the end of the day. I can assure you they don't. <laughs> Even with half the number of students that we have here, every day it was on the walkie-talkies, hold the bus, this one's not there. Oh, we have a calendar from parents, you're supposed to go to mom's, but oops, nope, you're going to dad's. And it's amazing the numbers of things that happen in a school day and the numbers of children that, and families that just, there's a missing piece of communication. And there's no way, um, and I wish there was a technology that could wrap that up. And I think you're, in a perfect world, we could. We could put that it all in technology. It is possible. But the, what happens on the user end when you're dealing with children and parents is a very different reality. And that's, um, that really is a challenge that I do think, they're, and kind of what you said, folks don't like this, they don't like this, they don't like this. And the level of service here is amazing. But I do really worry, because there is nothing like being on the other end of that phone hearing my mm -hmm. child's not home. Right. Oh, they might have been dropped off at the lake. <laughs> I don't know if you want to hit the water. Um, yeah. Or, yeah it's, um, if, so if there is something we could do to try to rein that in a little bit with the huge numbers of students we have now and 28, 29 buses at a school, it's, it, it is daunting. And with safety being our number one priority, it's, it, it is a huge burden. Is it possible to get, I mean, I, I understand that, that every day the snapshot is different from the day before right. because it's families, but is there any way to get any sort of even estimated data on like kind of the numbers of families who are in need of sort of a, a, a matrix solution or a e oh, not 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 that. not the ones that change like you know mm -hmm. in the middle of the day but sort of the, the number of families who sort of need like a matrix like Monday's here and Wednesday's here and yes. just, I just I just don't have any idea of magnitude so to be clear what we could do, I think, is we would eliminate all the kids who are picked up and dropped off in the same place, yeah. right? They yes. are sort of home bus exclusively. And then we could look at kids who have a morning bus and an afternoon bus, and we could take them off the table as well and just really look for the number of kids who are kind of all over the place. Yeah, that Just to get a sense of how big the population is that we would need to try to, you know, sit down with and say this is what we're facing and... Mm -hmm. I thought you had that number last year. Is it 230? Am I imagining the number? There, there are about 300 students that um, do more than do, one bus. Do the aftercare. So but they of do of some kind. But so those 300 kids do the same aftercare every day, or some of them do, or do they all they, do? They always have the option of switching. So that doesn't include kids that have aftercare that never switch. That's correct. So you could have you have three hundred kids. There could be one kid who never switches. Okay, know? so it's just three hundred going to aftercare. Three hundred, so right? It would but be, they always have that option of switching. They have the Still, option to right. switch, even though they don't switch. Correct. Gotcha. So. So at any given time, it could be a switch. Would a middle ground be to not allow like that? You if if you go to this bus stop on Mondays, you always have to go to that bus stop on Mondays. Like, you can't switch around. Do you know what I mean? It sounds like some kids are signed up to go to daycare, is my guess, on certain days, and they're allowed to then go home instead. Well, we can have some kids who will go mm -hmm. to Kidsboro on Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. They go to Dad's on Thursday, and they go to Grandma's on Monday, but they get picked up in the morning at Mom's. Like, that's hard to kind of figure when... It, so so that's one issue, but what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm not hearing Susan correctly, is that there are some kids that are signed up to go to, say, the, I don't know, the YMCA or someplace, Monday through Friday, but randomly on a Tuesday, they could end up on a different bus to go home. Right. Yes. Correct. That's correct. Yes. So that would seem like a simpler solution to eliminate that, because that's not a consistent everyday thing. I mean, it's not a consistent even every Tuesday, every Wednesday. It's a. I, I think you, it's it, it really almost has to be an all or nothing okay. thing. Um, I think what you heard from the principals in the fall when we had the, when we started the school year where the kids were always on their home bus. Mm -hmm. And so the home bus would take them to the daycare. That was awful. <laughs> but what you heard from the principals 
is the students, it was very smooth for the, from the student end because the student every single day knew what bus line to get in. So from the, on the school end, yes. the, yeah. the, the, the feedback we were receiving students. from, for the, the feedback we were receiving regarding those students was that they were on the bus much longer. But the, but the, the, in the, it was, in was, that it was the school and trying to get kids onto yes, but buses. that, that yeah. in yeah, some that cases was, kids were getting off at the wrong stop. Right. So not, that was not, a problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Yes. so not looking at that part of okay, the process, yes. but looking at the fact that the students knew every single day what bus they were going to get on. Gotcha. So if you always had, um, you know, if your stop was five days a week, it was either on that bus or it was parent pickup. That's what I'm saying. So the the stability and the routine for students would improve. Okay. That, did you have another question? I have a lot of sympathy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't have another question. I guess you know my my only you know next steps. My only thought is whatever we do involving the community somehow. You know, in the conversation. So and and if we can get any. I mean, I hear the need for some streamlining and, and simplification in our policies. It would help to know the date, like just get a better sense of like the kinds of, if there are buckets of families, like the ones that have a matrix, but it's stable, generally stable. The ones that, you know, how often are we dealing with changing buses or, you know, how often is it pretty much you get on the bus and you go home? Like how, is that like 90% of the people? Right. And 10% are kind of in this, <laughs> fluid zone or is it like 60 40 like I have no idea so if we could yeah. just get a little bit more information it might help yeah I think the preference obviously would be to have kids have a morning bus and a p.m. bus right I mean that would make things very easy and then if you had a p.m. bus and we had 45 kids leaving Elmwood going to Kidsboro they could all get on that bus and get over there in five minutes time I think the trouble when we had all those kids on different buses is that some kids got there in five minutes and some kids got there in 55 minutes and they rode by their homes I think yeah. that was kids, yes. It, that yeah. was yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a big one too. That was a direct. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going. We're not going back there. there. That's not that, the yeah. 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 yeah, that's something you hear from kids. They say, "Why can't I get off on this side?" Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, my question is back to the tears, which I know that was not favored in the report. I, is there a way we could get more um, specific information on the, the, what the impact would be to going to a two-tiered system? It, it, I hear that it's not going to be a savings, but would it be a significant cost difference and what would be the impact on, is there a way to run it through our software? So we did. Okay. Um, and it actually required two additional buses? And that's to go to two dismissal times, basically? Right. And the benefit of that, from your perspective, is... What is the benefit of putting Hopkins on that same dismissal time? It was just a trial just basis looking. to see if you had more time between the middle oh, right. school, high school, and then all the elementaries. Okay. Um, yeah. But combining the three schools actually necessitated two additional buses. The other piece to keep in mind is the way our contract is written right now, there's no difference in cost between a two-tier and a three-tier bus run. So the going from three tiers, meaning middle, high, Hopkins, elementary, to two tiers, middle, high, all elementary, yeah. didn't save us any money. Yeah. So, so it, the only way to save money would be to cut the buses, which we couldn't do. But so in a subsequent recontracting of this, it, it, there would be potential to have a There's two There's always potential if two -tiered you put bus it down only as a two-tier contract that maybe we would get different pricing? It would seem like less cost for them because they're not going to, they don't have to pay as long a labor time for their bus drivers, I would guess. But So keep in mind that the, what they keep uh, highlighting is the whole um, driver shortage issue. Um, so to a degree, some of our, I think our drivers are guaranteed a certain amount of time. So that's why I'm saying I, I don't know the business model to say right. that in a future contract, we would get a break. I don't know that. One other thing that was mentioned that I, I just you just brought up in my memory was the idea that Marathon and Elmwood are so far apart. Far apart. And again, rehashing something that we've already hashed through. But the, the question of 
maybe putting Marathon and Hopkins on right. the same schedule and making Elmwood on its own, you know, it would bring the older kids and the younger kids back together, and I know that opens up a whole can of worms. But at the same time, <coughs> it worked for it, it, 10 years or however many years, and I know there were reasons, I don't know what they are, that it went to the current model, but it, that seemed like a potential to save minutes, which still, when you're a little kid and you're talking about eight minutes, it's eight minutes. Right. So um, I don't know if that's a consideration or if that there are good reasons to keep that off the table. Yeah, I don't know. I would like to look more carefully at a two-tier system. I think right now that Hopkins run, we've got 22 buses leaving there with about an average of 20 kids on a 77-seater. Like that just, I don't know if we can renegotiate you know, when this contract ends with Conley or look to, you know, some other provider. But it does seem kind of silly to me to have 20 kids driving all over 28.2 right. square miles. Like that's, I don't know. And I, I get that we have 22 buses because we have to have so few stops so that we can finish a 35 minute run and get kids back to, and get those buses back to Elmwood and, and Center, I mean Marathon. And, so. and I'm also gonna throw out unrelated to it is related to busing, but not not just busing, is that one of the things that appealed to me about the two-tiered system was that if we are going to look at some point shifting start times at all, even just a little bit, having a two-tiered system would be much simpler than trying to shift start times for three tiers. I know we have not put that on our stated agenda of what we're I was going for, but I know the MASC is looking very seriously into it, and I know that there's some statewide initiatives. It, whether we take the move ourselves to look into it or whether the state imposes it on us at some point. It, it and even that minutes matter. You know, say it's only 20 yeah. minutes later start time. Right. It's 20 more minutes of sleep right. times five nights a week. That's you know significant. So yeah, I mean. And with the three tiered system, about. with the three tiered system, to sh just shift things ahead, one tier is going so late they're not getting home until dark right. in the winter right. practically, if you shifted it. But I'm, I'm looking to Amanda. She always has some thoughts, especially for the high schoolers about the shifting of the stop time? Well, yeah, that's it's too far in the future. That's, that's, that's a big topic. I think yeah. I put a lot of stock in Mr. Bishop's um, read. I think the students, I personally, what I see is that they are fine with where the start times are. Except 22% um, express that as one of their highest priorities. Well, they had so to pick one. The way the survey was written, they had to pick yeah. one. But 22% so. picked it. So that it's like, for some I know, and for the 12 that were in the room for that piece and I also know there's a lot of scientific research out there on it and at some point it may become a mandate from the state <laughs> there's I mean, not that I have some strong it's another, opinions it's on another it, topic but, for but, another agenda but I, day right. but I think I'm not saying we have that I am saying we need to do that right now but at some point I think we are going to need Factor. to discuss it and to invite the community in for their input and to kind of look at that to allow the discussion to move forward is all the, the only the only wacky think thinking that I've done on this and this is you know sort of out, out of the box, but looking at ways that we can enable every student to participate in after school activities, especially at the middle and the high school, by just running our return buses later. I know it's crazy, but not like having the bus leave at dismissal time, having the bus leave 45 minutes later. And it's, you know, if we ever rework the whole thing, I mean, I think the reality is we have a lot of students who come from families that have they have to take the bus. They don't have parents home who can pick them up and drive them. We can't afford a late bus. You know, me, if I were throwing something in this crazy hopper that does not need anything else, I would put in ways that we could maybe enable uh, middle and high school kids to get extra school, after school help, um, get time to go to clubs and activities, and not put kids who don't have rides at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So I, you know. Just as a reminder, we are running a late bus now. And we it are has grant been funded. Yeah. And there's maybe one student. Really? I've heard it, anecdotally really? on the social media webs, people seem to really like it. So the one or two students, whoever's riding it, is happy. But um, it's a lot of money for one or two students. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just you know, just to give you an idea of the ouch, right. how it's going. But well, I think you know, to Mr. Bish. Like, Mr. Bishop's work on the scheduling and, and kids trying to find times to do the clubs and do school and get help and you know some of the things belong absolutely in the six hour day and some of the things could maybe be the half hour or 45 minutes afterward mm -hmm. and 
how do we as a community support? I don't know. I think we might need to be looking in the next five years at getting creative. I don't know. Just a thought. All right. So to be continued. I, I have just one question. Uh, wasn't the, those buses open to middle school also? Mm -hmm. Middle school and high school. Right. Middle school and high school. I don't and know that still, it's been advertised there's just to the parents of the middle school. However, no. that that I don't know. Okay. Oh. Well, so then, then it definitely well, has some of them do ride it. <laughs> yeah. Middle school. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, think. they have been riding. Yeah, I, but like I, I remember. Said, it, the, the, that. the demand. The demand is not. That's interesting not because I've heard that from the community too, mm -hmm. that there is interest. You know, we would want that. I heard that at office hours at the beginning of the year. Right. No, I've heard that even otherwise outside of office hours. I think there's some confusion among the community about how it works and mm -hmm. how to, you know, is it, I think kids in high school received some notification of how to sign up. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the kids know, but I don't think necessarily the community as a whole is fully aware, just based on the, the conversations. They're not sure if it's middle school or high school or exactly how to do it or well, kids we don't exactly for. share that information with their parents. You know, it's... All right, so my recommendation would be that we kind of take this and kind of determine at a future point what, if anything, we want to act on from this report. Does that seem reasonable to people? Yes. And then if that's the case, we have an opportunity for public comment, if there's anybody that would like to come speak. Um, if not, I see somebody, nope, he's not coming in here. Uh, if not, we will move on to items by consensus. Okay, so I recommend that the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Go ahead. Second. So motion by Mina and a second. Was that Amanda or Second. Jeff? Amanda. 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 Uh, all those in favor? Yes. Aye. Right. And it passes. And then I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Mina and a second by second. Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned at 9.25. Thank you all for uh, coming and tuning in. Our next meeting, uh, we have an executive session, of course, on Tuesday, April 9th, uh, here in the high school. And then we have our next regular scheduled meeting is April 25th, 2019, here in the high school library. And then into May, the 16th. So thank you very much, and have a good night. Good night. Thank you.